Good morning, everyone. I love what the song says, a declaration, I'm going to make it through. And, and you'll never make it through until you have the faith to say, I'll make it through. Because I'm building my life on a firm foundation, which is Jesus. I'm not making it through because I'm awesome. I'm not making it through because I'm strong enough. I'm making it through because I have faith in the foundation I'm building my life on, which is Christ. To say that you're building your life on Christ is the same thing as saying this. I hear God's word and I do it. It'd be a shame, to, it'd be really silly to believe that you're building your house on a firm foundation if you're hearing the word and you're not applying it. We come to the house of God today to hear God's word and adjust our lives. How many understand that? I'm not here to justify my mess. I'm here to clean it up with God's help. Never when you hear the word allow being offended to stop you from growing. We're hearing the word, and some of the word might offend an error in your life that needs to change. Go ahead and receive forgiveness. Turn away from the wrong behavior. Change the way you think about that, and allow God to do the change in your life. When God, when God shows you something, he is not showing you to condemn you. He's showing you to transform you. How many believe that God has something better for you, but you have to be leadable? I don't want to justify my anger, my unforgiveness. I don't want to justify my wrong behavior. We're really good at that, right? We're really good at picking out other people's faults and justifying our own. We're, it's just kind of we're just made that way. We're here to learn today. We're going to be learning the next, next 30 days. We're going to start our 30-day growth challenge. This is what God is saying. I'm challenging you to grow in the next 30 days. I spent 12 hours yesterday working on the 30-day growth journal. Uh, we're going to release two journals, first 15 days and second 15 days. We're going to have a half time in the first 15 days, and then we're going to come back and you're going to get another journal. But this journal, the way we've written it, it's kind of like me having Bible study with you. All day, I mean, every, every scripture we're going to be going over. As you're going through your commentary and going through your journal, it's just like I'm sitting in your living room and just, hey, this is what I see in the scripture. You're going to grow a whole bunch in the next 30 days. The goal of the next 30 day challenge is that you come out with a love for the word of God, a greater understanding of the word of God, that you come out more grateful with a greater prayer life and a consistent devotion time with God every single day. We're, it's going to be awesome. You do not want to miss the next 30 days. It's going to be a stretch. We're also going to fast for 30 days. It's going to be a little easier fast. All we're going to do is you're going to eat what you regularly eat, um, but you are going to just drink water. No more Cokes, coffee, sodas, Pepsis, Orange Crush, right? Lemonades, teas, beer, alcohol, or or marijuana. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Somebody's gonna get set free from all of it today in this next 30 days. I'm being ready to come up for a transformation. So it's gonna be really good. What you put in is what you're gonna get out. I'm really gonna ask you, let's do this together and let's stretch. Are you guys ready to stretch for growth? It's great. We're going to pray right now and welcome the Holy Spirit to this moment. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. You are our teacher. Lead us, guide us. Reveal your word, your revelation. Reveal Jesus to us. Help us to understand your word. Give us the power and the will to do it so that we can get your results feel your purpose. I thank you, Lord, that today we will grow. Even if it's just a little bit, we will grow. We're willing to learn. We're willing to apply. 
and we're willing to receive love today. And we're also willing to give love. We're willing to receive forgiveness. And we're also willing to give forgiveness. Today, make us more like you. We command every spirit of unbelief, of division, anger, unforgiveness, hate, division. Leave now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, take over the atmosphere. Take over our hearts. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in our lives, on earth, in this church, in this city, in our homes, the way it has already pre been predetermined in heaven. We surrender our will to you today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for being here today. Everyone online, and we got people tuning in all over the place. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you actually made the effort to show up to church. I really believe that church needs to be a discipline, that we continue showing up when we, when we feel like it, when we don't feel like it. You have 168 hours a week. Give God two hours of every week. It's a great investment. You'll get a return on that. So today we're going to be talking about choosing to love is choosing to forgive. If I say I love someone, it comes with a choice to forgive the people I love. You cannot say that you are loving if you're not forgiven. Love and forgiveness always come together. You could say, you could say, I really know the word. It's great that you know the word. I'm really gifted. I know you're gifted. But if you don't have love, you're nothing. You have no power in the spiritual realm. You'll never have peace. You'll never have joy. And I know this, your relationships will always be falling apart. If you're in relationships with human beings, which you are, you will need to master this skill of loving people and forgiving them. The reason you have to master the skill, there's not a person, there's not a church, there's not a business partner, there's not a husband, there's not a wife, there's not a child, there's not a boss that you will ever have that won't have major faults. You have faults. Others have faults. People are careless, hurting, angry, and at times willfully doing what they can to hurt you. And if you don't know how to forgive, they'll trap you. Let's talk about forgiveness a little bit. Forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a choice more than it is a feeling. We First we forgive, then healing, freedom, and feelings come. We can't wait until we feel like forgiving others to forgive them. If you're trying to get approval from your emotions, your emotions will never say yes. You forgive because you love. You do not forgive because they deserve it. God forgave you. Jesus on the cross, we covered last week. He's on the cross in his greatest pain. And what does he say? Forgive them for they know not what they do. He did not forgive because he was feeling it. He forgave because he was committed to loving you. I looked up the word forgiveness, and this is the definition psychologists use. And when I looked up this definition, I go, it's a great definition. It, this is what it is, a conscious, deliberate decision. Forgiveness is a choice. And what's the decision? To release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who has harmed you. Forgiveness is a decision, a deliberate decision to forgive, release feelings of resentment and vengeance. I'm letting it go. Regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. That's a... That's the definition psychologists are using, and it's right in line with the Bible. That forgiveness is a deliberate choice. It's not a feeling. They don't deserve to be forgiven. It doesn't matter. I just forgive you. Because when I forgive you, I re this is what happens to me. I could be whole. I could love, I could have joy, I could have peace, I could get creativity, God could speak to me, I could fulfill purpose, I could succeed if I forgive. If I don't forgive, my creativity is trapped. I cannot jo have joy, I cannot love, I cannot grow, 
and I cannot be healed or be used by God to be a healer. God adds something to this definition. God adds acts of kindness, spoken blessing over those we have forgiven. And he also adds stop talking about the offense and the offenders in a negative way. So God adds, we not, we not only forgive, but this is what we do. We bless. How do you know you're forgiving someone? You could actually do an act of kindness. See, when, you're, when we're walking in unforgiveness, this is what we, we do. We withhold goodness from others. I'm walking up, you, you withhold your presence, you withhold your love, you give people the silent treatment, you withhold your smile, you withhold. And God is saying, you not only deliberately forgive them, you need to deliberately do something nice to them. Seal it with an act of kindness. You guys got that? Another statement, opening statement I want to make is refusing to forgive others is refusing to love others. No love equals no forgiveness. In 2 Timothy 3.3, 3, look at this. It says, they will have no love for others and they will have no love for others and will refuse to forgive anyone. When we are choosing not to forgive, we're also choosing not to love. Lo choosing not to love equals not forgiven people. God has created us to be loved and to love people. You'll never be whole without love. It's time to forgive people. It's time to forgive those that have deliberately hurt you. I know they did it. They might never get it. They might never understand it, but it's time for you to be free. It's time for you to be, be whole. It's time for you to dream again. It's time for you to succeed again. It's time for you to be anointed again. Power. Do you know what happens to a lot of ministers that have been doing ministry a long time? They become bitter preachers. Do you know how many ministers have become bitter and negative? And they use this pulpit to, to, to destroy the people in their own audience because the people in their audience have offended them and hurt them. They no longer have a ministry. A ministry is there to serve the people, not destroy them. And if you're holding on to unforgiveness, hate, and anger, you become a destructive human being. Let's keep going on this. They will have no love for others and refuse to forgive anyone. If you're refusing to forgive someone, you are refusing to love them as well. How do you know you might have unforgiveness in your heart? This is how you know. They will talk about others to hurt them and will have no self-control, angry, and they will be cruel, heartless. So how do you know you might have unforgiveness in your heart? It's coming out of your mouth. When you have unforgiveness towards someone, you speak hurtful things. You slander the people you don't like. And there's a cycle that happens. The more you talk about them, the more your heart gets contaminated and poisoned with the conversation. The Bible says what contaminates or ruins a person is not the food he eats. Could it be that you're more interested in your, your health diet than your spiritual diet? You're vegan, you eat healthy, you drink water, you exercise, but your mouth is full of poison. How do you know you have unforgiveness? There's somebody in your life that you're talking negative about, and you just can't help it. You wake up, you go, y'all was just thinking about John. I don't know. I know you've been talking about John and thinking about John every single day, but it's 10 years later, you're still talking about what he did 20 years ago. I know he took your inheritance. Let it go. Because now he's trying to, trying to take your spiritual inheritance. He's trying to take your purpose. He's trying to take your family. If you'll get them out of your heart, God could give you a new vision, a new conversation. Maybe you could put the gospel back in your mouth to help somebody get saved, delivered, and set free. 
What's in your heart comes out of your mouth. Stop talking about people. Start blessing them. Start being an encourager. Un come on, let go of the unforgiveness and allow God to fill your heart with love, vision, and purpose. And let that start coming out of your mouth. Because what has control of your heart and your mouth has control of your future. Talk about others or hurt them. And, and this is a problem. Once you have unforgiveness in your heart, you'll talk your words will have poison and hurt attached to them, not only with the person that you have unforgiveness towards, it starts overflowing everywhere. Do you know that some of us here, you have a, a secret cuss in life? You slip words. And you, I don't, how did that come out of me? Oh my, man, I, I thought I got over that. And the reason the cussing is still there is because the unforgiveness is still there. The cussing, all it's doing is revealing your heart. And until you forgive that person, this is what's going to happen. Your mouth will only reflect the poison and the trash in your heart. All right, you guys still with me? Someone just said, I got to get out of here. No, I'm just going to. Martin Luther King said this, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. I, I just, I think that's, we could stop there for a second. First of all, if you're going to develop, if you're going to ever be a mature believer, you're going to have to develop a, a capacity to love and maintain, to forgive and maintain an attitude of forgiveness. To be great at forgiving others, it's a skill that is developed. Say with me. It's a skill that is what? There are people in your life, you're mad at them, you're upset with them, and they keep tripping you up. And you're saying, God, get them out of my life. And God says, no, they're supposed to be teaching you a skill you haven't developed yet. How are you going to learn to forgive if you don't have some offensive people around you? God says, you think, it, you think it's the devil, it's actually me allowing it in your life because I want you to mature and I want you to grow and I want you to learn how to forgive the way I forgave you. You know you're mature when you, bec when you become unoffendable. The more you mature spiritually, the less you realize how offensive people are. It gets to the point that someone told you off and you didn't know. Did you hear what they said? No, I didn't. I was so busy focusing on ministry, focusing on vision, focusing on my career, focusing on building something. I didn't even hear that because I'm not tuned in to that negative tone anymore in my life. I used to tune into that station, not no more. I'm at a higher level and I don't allow my mind and my spirit to go to that level. But if you stay there, everybody will be offending you. Who are you mad at? Who are you upset with? I don't know. Who are you talking about? That's the person. Who are you slandering? That's the person. The best way to get back at your enemies is just succeed. Be happy and fulfill the purpose of God in your life. Amen. Martin Luther King says, he who is a devoid of the power to forgive, forgiveness is power. Someone say, forgiveness is what? Is devoid of the power to love. If we never learn how to forgive people, this is what, this, you'll never walk in the power of love ever. Pastor, do you have anybody you're upset that you're upset with? No. Because I don't want no one controlling my life, my dreams, my, my I, I see the problem when you when you have unforgiveness in your heart, you do sleep with your enemy every night. They go on vacation with you. And you and your wife are arguing and fighting with each other, saying, Every time we go on vacation, we fight. I'll tell you why. Because there's unforgiveness in the heart. And the unforgiveness ruins every single 
dinner, every single vacation, every single conversation, the anger overflows. I just need to learn how to forgive. When you're, when, when you're forgiven, this is what happens. You're not critical. People that have unforgiveness in their heart are super critical. They'll even come in the atmosphere like this and they'll focus on, they'll focus on the one thing that's wrong. You got captured somewhere on some negativity and you can't even see good anymore because your mind was captured by the unforgiveness and the hate and the self-criticism. You criticize yourself, you criticize everybody, and you're not free to even encourage anybody. You feel weird saying something nice. <laughs> like I feel weird showing, saying something nice. Like I really like, I really like the way you dress today. Oh, that's weird. feel real awkward saying that, but you don't feel awkward talking about, can you believe she wore that to church? She thinks she's a club or what? And you think, and you guys are all laughing, but the sarcasm and the criticism is only telling on you that you have unforgiveness in your heart. All right, are you still with me though? Okay. Three steps to love and forgive others. Three simple steps. Step number one, receive forgiveness and give in. God is not asking you to give something that you've not received. Do not try to forgive others until you understand that you're a sinner, that there's times you're offensive, that you've hurt people. First, Acknowledge your sin, receive forgiveness, and then use that as your platform to forgive others. I want you to receive forgiveness, but I don't ever want you to forget what God forgave you of. I'm not saying that you need to live in the past. You need to be grateful for what God has done. We could get to the point that we become self-righteous because we forgot you're better than you used to be, but don't forget what you used to be. Because someone might be where you used to be and they need some mercy and love. They don't need to be self-righteous, religious, and critical. You need to let them know, I was there. I forgive you. I totally understand. And Jesus forgave me for far, for far worse things that you're doing. And because he forgave me, I forgive you. Pattern. It's a pattern. God forgives me. I forgive you. God forgives me. I love it. Let's look at Colossians 3.13. The scripture says, don't be angry with each other. Now you may say, well, I get angry. This is what it really means. Don't stay angry with each other. It doesn't mean that you won't be upset. I, I, I was trying to think about what, what upset me this week. And it was something that upset me this week. And the people that are closest to you are the ones that upset you the most. Like, I love my wife, but she upset me the other day. Because they're like, ooh, please tell us. Please, the juicy details, don't leave nothing out. No. Well, we were having guests over the house. And, and I told Lisa, why don't you go ahead and get some food. And bring it so the guests, when they come, they have something. And I told her, um, I want some ribs. So go to Dickie's and get me some ribs. She goes to Dickie's and gets me four ribs. Four ribs. There's like 18 people coming over. We're going to cut these ribs in little pieces. Make a whole bunch of sort ribs, you're right. Pray for it, just cut them in 18 pieces. Everybody gets one. We're going to pray that multiplies in your stomach. <laughs> but I got upset. I go, Lisa, we're bringing people over, and you got four ribs. And she goes, oh, I thought you were hungry and you wanted ribs. I go, I know, but I did mention other people are coming. She's not here right now, so let's talk. 
I didn't bring it up to first service. And you're not going to tell her, are you? I'm, uh, we're, oh, no. Well, you know, right here, what's done in church stays in church. And I said, <laughs> I was upset, and I just, I, I said some things like, it's kind of common sense. See, no, don't be judging me. See, already, you're going on the wrong track. But it, to me, it was a like common sense. It reminded people, I know, but I didn't hear that. I go, okay. The truth, I was angry. But I didn't stay angry. That's the key. And I'm not justifying you have a tantrum and then come back, at least I didn't stay angry. It was just my response and it wasn't very mature. Still working. <laughs> God's still working on me. But I let him work on me because I told her I'm sorry. And I let it go, and I didn't go to bed with resentments and wake up in the morning. I can't believe about that rib thing. And we know you haven't forgiven because you're still talking about it hours later, days later, and the ribs keep coming up. And the reason the ribs keep coming up is because you are still harboring resentment, and you want them to pay for not giving you the ribs. I'm going to show you how much it hurt me that you didn't get the ribs. You will pay for at least a week. Some of you guys are like that. Come on. Don't be angry. Just don't, these all, don't stay angry with each other. But forgive each other. It's mentioned, this is one, one scripture. What's the command? Forgive each other. What's the command? What does that mean? Make a conscious, deliber deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who has harmed you and do something nice to them. And don't talk about it anymore. That's it. Forgive them. Is that a command? Okay, so forgive them. Look what it goes on to say. If you feel someone has wronged you, Forgive them. Now, this is the same exact scripture. It just said forgive them, and then it repeats it again. Forgive them. Maybe you didn't hear it the first time. Forgive them. Forgive them. And I like the word feel in there. Forgive them if you feel they did something wrong to you. Why is that important? Because that has to do with perspective. There's people that didn't do nothing to you, but you think they did you wrong, and you got resentment because you haven't been really good at processing forgiveness towards others, and someone hurts you, and you're taking all that hurt and pain into the next relationship, into the next room, into the next church. You're reading stuff that's not even there. Uh, well, I, I know. I know what they were thinking. How do you know? Are you a clairvoyant? How do you know? You think you know. Well, they don't love me. How do you know they don't love you? That's perspective. They hurt you, and they weren't trying to hurt you, but because your perspective is off, you're receiving hurt. Easy. But the Scripture says even if you feel they hurt you, forgive them. Even if they feel you, they hurt you, what? And you know what that means? Let it go. Let go of the resentment, bless them, do good to them, and talk well of them. Let it go. I love it. Now look what he says. Forgive others. Again? That's the third time in one, one scripture you say forgive. Yeah, forgive them, forgive them. Let me reinterpret it, forgive others. Can you get it? There's a point that's being driven home. What is the point? I can't see it. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Forgive others because the Lord forgave you. Now, that go, that, now we get to the key. The reason you forgive others is because God forgave you, and all you're doing is passing on the gift. 
I become real good at forgiving others when I'm really grateful and aware of what God has forgiven me of. I not only remember what he's forgiven me of, I also know the cost that it took for him to forgive me. He had to give his only son to suffer and die to reconcile a relationship with me. Even though I didn't deserve it, I was still in sin. And God reached out to me. He made the first move. He paid the price so we can have a healthy relationship. And God says, I want you to forgive them the way I forgave you. Only those that continue to choose to give forgiveness will continue to receive forgiveness. So I, I tell you, if you don't know how to process people's hurt, your hurt, your pain, betrayal, neglect, abuse, you will get to the point that your relationship with God is totally impaired hindered because you don't forgive. When God says, if you forgive, look at the scripture said, look at this, look at this, Matthew 6, 14, Jesus taught this. If, someone said conditional statement. You know what that means? We have a choice to forgive people or not to forgive them. Both choices will be deliberate. If you forgive others, their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, your heavenly father will also forgive you. That's a good exchange. Healthy. I forgive you. You forgive others. I forgive you. Let's keep the forgiveness going. And also what we're saying is let's keep the love going. Let's keep the power going. Let's keep the revelation going. Let's keep the joy going. Come on, let's keep the, come on, let's keep the faith going. Let's keep the discipleship going. Let's keep the ministry growing. It all stops when I stop. Choose not to forgive. Say it with me. It all stops. The blessings stop. The favor stops. The vision stops. The ministry stops. The growth stops. The moment I choose not to forgive, everything stops until I forgive. Look what it says. You cannot circumvent around this. There's no way around it. Until you forgive, your favor is not restored. And until you forgive, God won't talk to you about anything else until you forgive. You're going to find yourself on the outside because God's going to say, time out, it's time to forgive. But I can sing. I know you can sing, but your heart's not right. I want worshipers that worship me in spirit and in truth. And right now you're worshiping the devil with all that hate in your heart. Singing my words with the devil's heart. Glory to Jesus. Okay. But if you do not forgive others, choice. This is how you know you're not forgiving. Nurturing your hurt. That's like feeding your hurt. How do you feed your hurt? You're meditating on what they did. You're just constantly in your mind, nursing, 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 feeding it, feeding it, talking about it, talking about it. Oh, my gosh, I hate them. They're so stupid. I, got, I can't stand them. I, that's the straw that broke the camel's back. I, I'm done with them. I, I, I'm going to X them out of my life. I'm going to X them out of my will. They're, they're, I, I am so, 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 I'm so, 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 so done with them. They, they, didn't, they don't even know what they're doing. I am. Could it be that that's your conversation and that's what you're talking about? And the devil's like saying, I love this. Because that is disconnecting you from your relationship with the Lord. Look at this says. If you do not forgive others, nurturing your hurt and anger with, with the result that it interferes with your relationship with God, then your father will not forgive your trespasses. Ungodly pattern. God forgives us. We do not forgive others. And God does not forgive us. As soon as we stop forgiving others, the blessings stop rolling in. 
I want to succeed in my business. How can you succeed in your business when your heart is corrupt? I want God to promote me and use me greatly. I can't use you greatly because I can't even control your heart yet. The only way that we're going to see greatness in life, if our hearts are full of love. And that's going to be a choice at times. I don't feel like forgiving them. That's okay, just do it. Well, you don't know what they stole from me. I, I, I don't know what they stole from you, but it doesn't matter. You hold on to the resentment, it's not going to bring it back. Let it go. Let's keep going. Okay, step number two. Let's get through this real quick. Choose love and forgiveness over anger and bitterness. Say when they choose love. So the first part, receive forgiveness and give it. Say with me, receive forgiveness and we forgive because God has forgiven us. Ephesians 4.31, look at this. It has some commands in there. Let me see if you can find them. Number one, never be bitter, angry, or mad. Command number one. And that has to do with your emotion. Let it go. Don't allow your heart to get bitter. Don't hold on to anger. Don't be mad. Let it go. Be loving. Be kind. Be forgiving. Well, they're going to take advantage. They're not going to take advantage of you. This is what happens when you don't forgive them. They rule over you. I forget. I let it go. I refuse to be angry, mad, and bitter. Number two command, never shout angrily or say things that hurt others. Never. This has to do with your mouth. This is a command for your mouth. Just because you feel like saying it doesn't mean you need to let it out of your mouth. Get control of your mouth. Never ever raise your voice and shout hurtful things to others no matter what they've done. Stop being ghetto. Being a believer is not being a believer in church alone. Being a believer, come on, and representative of Christ is out there too. When they're cussing at you, you don't cuss at them. Never, ever, ever, ever shout hurtful things to anybody. But what about my kids? They don't listen unless I cuss them out a few times. You train them wrong. And you have to retrain yourself and reset the stage. Stop reacting to a two-year-old and acting like them. They throw a tantrum, you throw one too. We're all messed up. Who's parenting who? Well, you don't know my mother-in-law. I don't know your mother-in-law, but God does. But God says never shout. Never say hurtful things. Ever, never, ever, ever. You don't allow your mouth to say curse words towards anybody. Because understand, when you're cursing them, you're cursing yourself. That's the trick about curse words. They're called curse words. That means that the word actually curse. You're cursing yourself when you're cursing somebody else. All right. You guys still with me? Never do anything evil. You know what this means? It's a, it, this, this is a command. This is a command and, and attitude about being nice. But this is what he's saying. Never do anything hurtful to anybody. What I do, what we're supposed to do is bless people, help people, love people, encourage people. Never ever go out there intentionally to hurt someone and take revenge. Don't do it. It's going to backfire. And the last thing is the last, look at this. Be kind and loving. That has to do with attitude. Loving each other, forgive each other as the same as God forgave you through Christ. Do you guys see it again? Forgive and forgive and love. Love and forgiveness come together. Forgive each other. It's a choice. Choosing not to forgive others opens the door to demonic oppression 
and defeat. Now I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to stop here for just a second. I'm going to make this real clear. There's, a, there's, there's all kinds of talk, can a Christian have a demon? And this is what the Bible says. That if you, you read here, if you choose not to forgive someone, you give an opportunity for a devil to enter your life. Demons enter through permits. If you give hell a permit to invade your life and make a room for demons to come, they will come. Look at this. Ephesians 4.26, be angry at sin, at immorality, at injustice, at ungodly behavior, yet do not sin. Do not let your anger cause you to shame nor allow it to, allow it to last until the sun goes down. What he's saying is you could get angry, you know, upset about something. I mean, that's okay. But don't let it, don't let it last after the sun goes down. Don't take it into the next day. Let it go today. Solve it today. Forgive them today. Reconcile today. Pray for them today. Right? Today is the day to go ahead and release yourself from the prison of unforgiveness. There's a statement I read the other day is to forgive it's to, is to set a prisoner free to come to realize the prisoner was me. That's what happens when you forgive. You, get, you set yourself free. Isn't that good? Look, verse 27. Now, if you choose not to forgive and hold on to anger one day to the next, and it's part of your conversation, it says, this, and do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into sin by holding a grudge or nurturing anger or harboring resentment or cultivating bitterness. That word opportunity, this is what it means. The word opportunity means a place. What he's saying, if I hold on to unforgiveness, I create a place. Say with me, a place. It also means a room. It also means a space marked off. Imagine this, having a space in your life that's marked off for a demon. When we choose to hold on to a grudge, harbor unforgiveness, we're given an opportunity or a marked off space for demons to come. Hate comes to fortify the position. Lust comes. Anxiety comes. Fear comes. Sickness comes. Do you know how many people that have actually been involved healing them of a physical ailment and they're healed only after they forgive someone. How did the demon enter? I, I, I shared a story in, uh, the other day that, that there was a lady I prayed for in our church. And, and while I was praying for her, she started manifesting a demon. And I asked, uh, and the demon came up. And when the demon came up in her, her hands began to be like this. And then, and then. The demon looked at me, and I go, who are you? He goes, palsy, cerebral palsy. I go, okay. And I asked him, well, how did you enter? And, she, and the demon said this, when she refused to forgive her husband. Now, I want you to understand this lady did not have cerebral palsy. But there was a demon that was going to manifest later in her life that was in her when she chose not to forgive. It opened the door for a demon from hell to bring unforgiveness, hate, anger, and sickness. Someone's going to get healed today. God wants to heal your heart, your emotions, and your body today. That word opportunity is a place, a habitation, a license, official permission, permission to do something, legal right to grant authority. When you want to build something, you have to go get a permit. And, and saying is saying this, is there anybody that wants to give me a permit to come kill, steal, and destroy in your life, in your family, in your kids, in your business, in your financing? If you give me a permit, I promise you I'll come and build a stronghold to destroy your life. And until you forgive, I'll be there. And I have legal right. Do you know how many times I've been, 
I, I've been involved in the deliverance, and the demon tells me I'm not leaving because she wants me here or he wants me here. Well, how do they want you there? How did you get in? They don't forgive their mama. And if they're not willing to forgive their mama, I got every right to stay right here and destroy her life. And you know what? The demon is right. Because he has a permit to build. And you know what he does? He shows me the permit. Look, I got the permit. Here it is. I got an official government permit to give it to you to build right now. You cannot kick me off this project. I'm the contractor. I got permission from her, and I'll stay here as long as she holds on to unforgiveness. He holds on to unforgiveness. I will be here and destroy them, visit them at night, cause them nightmares, cause them sickness, destroy their family, destroy their marriage, destroy their emotions, destroy their intimacy with God. I'll destroy the ministry. I'll destroy their future. I will fill them with hell. All I'm saying is you've given permission, time to revoke your permit. There's only one way to do that. You got to forgive. Now, this is the last thing. Step number three, declare forgiveness and pray for offenders. Now, this is hard. But you cannot forgive silently. Because you didn't cuss silently. You didn't gossip silently. You didn't murmur silently. You didn't slander silently. You were in your private rooms, private conversations, just blah, 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 and their mama too. You can't be selling that, sending people to hell every five minutes and act like you didn't say it. You go to hell, you go to hell, you go to hell. I'm hanging out free tickets to hell here, everybody. You got to know you said it, and then you got to renounce it. Say, I've been holding on to bitterness, holding on to forgiveness. I've allowed demons in my life. There's no wonder I can't get ahead. There's no wonder I'm hindered, and there's no wonder I'm praying that I don't see the blessing come because God is saying, I am more concerned about your spiritual life than your physical prosperity. I want you to prosper as your soul prospers, but your soul cannot prosper when you have unforgiveness. Let it go. Best example, Stephen's response to stoning was praying to God and declaring his forgiveness for his persecutors. Now, this is a real story in the Bible about Stephen. He does a sermon, people get offended, and what do they try to do? Kill the messenger, (laughs) literally. The religious leaders didn't like what he said, and they all got together and said, let's kill him right now. They all got heavy stones, it circled around him. And began to throw them, crushing his head, crushing his body, one after the other with force. Ha! 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 And while he's being hit with these stones, he has a choice to react to the stoning or react. To the Holy Spirit. There was a man there named Saul that was there in that stoning, and he was most likely the person that caused it. He would later be saved, be born again, and write the majority of the New Testament. But I believe this moment showed Paul, Saul, that God was real, that Jesus does change hearts. Because after all the stonings he ever did, he never seen someone respond in this kind of love. You have never gone through a stoning like that. They just said something negative on Facebook and it it destroyed your life. Well, they said that they didn't like my makeup. I can't handle this persecution. The Bible says the last days will be persecuted. That is not persecution. Acts 7, 12, 15, I would be done here. They continued stoning him. They continued what? So they never stopped. He didn't, he didn't say, when you guys stop, I'll forgive you. But if you keep stoning me, I'm not going to forgive you. I'm going to curse you and send all you guys to hell. He didn't do that. 
as he called on the Lord, as he what? And said, Lord Jesus, receive and accept and welcome my spirit. I'm dying. Then fallen on his knees in worship. In what? Can you worship someone? I mean, worship God when someone's persecuting you? The real test is not you worshiping and loving people when they're nice to you. The real proof of your heart and the Holy Spirit controlling your life is that you could be nice to someone and love them while they're dogging you. Let's show, let's show this world some Christ. Come on, let's show this world Jesus Christ. Look at this. Then follow this, he worship, he cried out. This is what he cried out loudly, loudly, loudly. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Do not charge them. When he said this, he fell asleep in death. He died. But his last words were, you didn't conquer me. Love. still worshiping, I'm still praying, and I'm still loving. God is ready to do some great things in your life. But I really believe that we're in a war, and one of the easiest ways to be conquered is just by an offensive person that's close to you. Maybe they really did hurt you. They really did offend you. They really did betray you. She really did leave you. They really did go out on you. They really stole something from you. They caused death and loss in your family. I get it, it's real. But God is saying, don't let them hurt you anymore. Forgive them. Bless them. And be free to fly, to soar, to mount up with wings of eagles and take all the limits and anchors off your life. Some of you have not smiled for a really long time. It's time to get your joy back. Your smile is hard to do because the discouragement is so high. There's oppression there, demonic oppression. And God says, if you'll forgive, I'll remove that oppression. And then I will baptize you with my joy and my spirit and my peace. The nightmares will turn into visions and dreams from heaven. Get ready. Prosperity and blessing will be released on your life. You'll begin to start stabilizing. Understand, every time we allow the enemy to win in this unforgiveness thing, some of us are almost starting over. Because ah, we got to like start over this cycle here because we got to make sure you get it. You're never going to go to the next level until you graduate to the next level. We always forgive. We never shout. We never cuss. And if you do, just say, God, I'm sorry. But don't hold on to it. Receive forgiveness. And I'll say one more last thing. Receive forgiveness and forgive yourself. Stop beating yourself up. If God's forgiving you, forgive yourself and allow yourself to prosper. Come on. If you can't forgive yourself, you're never going to forgive anybody else. Are you guys ready? Come on. Let's give the Lord a hands a good God. Christian, let's close this out. Wednesday night, you don't want to miss it. Let's all stand up. I'll dis we'll dismiss in just a second. We're going to give you two opportunities real quick. One is to receive forgiveness. And a second great opportunity to forgive someone. It's to set a prisoner free. So just to realize the prisoner was me. I just pray that you leave here happy with joy, peace, and freedom to fulfill everything that God has for your life. Overcome all those offenders and eventually they just go away. All right? The more attention you give them, the more they stay. It's time to move on, okay? You guys are awesome. Love you guys. I'm going to receive that word this morning. Just when he's talking about forgiveness, what happens sometimes is that person will come to mind. Just a name will come up. I got to forgive my mom. It could be someone in your family. Just the name or the face just came up. I, I needed that message. How many needed that message this morning? We need that as a church. You know, there will never be a time in our lives where we won't need the love and the forgiveness for ourselves. 
And there will never be a time in our lives where we won't need to forgive other people. Always we'll need to walk in love and forgiveness. And so today we're going to get a chance to respond to this word this morning. And I want to make two calls as pastor said. The first, I wanna, the first call I want to make is for those that want to put their faith in Jesus. The Bible says it's true. The Bible's so true. We've all fallen short, which mean, means we've all messed up. How many know that that's true? I don't have to know you personally to know that you've messed up. You may not have to know me to know I've messed up. We've fallen short of the glory of God. We've sinned. The Bible teaches us that there's a price for every sin. Price for even for one sin. And you know what the price is? It's death. And death means eternal separation from God. I'll put it another way. It's hell forever. When we sin, our punishment, the only way we can pay back for our sin is hell forever. That's the way we pay it. So you mean I can't be a good person and just come to church and do good deeds and, you know, try to live a good life and not steal too much. I haven't murdered no one. So, so you mean I can't go to heaven because of those things? The Bible says even our good works are like filthy rags before the Lord. Not all the good things you do make up for even one sin. So where's the hope? I'll tell you where the hope is. God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins. For what you've done. You know what you've done. I know what I've done. All our sins put Jesus on the cross. He took them all upon himself. It became a sin so that we can inherit the righteousness of Christ. So God loved us so much, he was willing to pay the price on all of our behalf. So how can I be saved? How can I be forgiven? If I can't do good things to earn my salvation, what should I do? This is what, this is what we do. We put our faith in Jesus Christ. We put our faith in him. We give him our life. Our hope is in him. Our life is in him. All we need to do is trust that Jesus is enough. Give him your heart today. Repent of your sins. That means turn away from the old, old way of living and turn to Christ today. Let him be the Lord of your life. From this moment forward, what you're saying is, I'm giving Jesus my life and I'm putting my faith in the sacrifice that he made for me. No longer am I going to try and earn God's love, but I'm going to freely receive his love and his forgiveness and become one with him. That's what happens. That's how we're saved. And when you're saved, you don't go on living the same way. I heard someone say this earlier. When you get married, you don't leave your wedding day acting like you're single. Come on, when you're joined with Christ, you live with him and live life with him. And your life will change forever. And he'll give you the power to live a brand new start. So I'm going to make the first call. If you're saying, I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to be forgiven of my sin. I want to know that if I were to die today, that I'd be in heaven for eternity with God forever. If you're saying you want to receive Jesus, you want to receive salvation today, and you want to know that you'd spend eternity with God forever, then when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand and raise your hand boldly. Don't be afraid because God was not ashamed or afraid to die for you. And today he's asking, he's calling you to himself. So when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand all over this room if that's you. Ready? Are we ready? Here we go. One, two, three. All over this room, you're saying that to me. I want to receive Jesus. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand right here. Anybody else? I see those hands. I see your hand right there. Anybody else? In the back, we see hands. Anybody else? I see all those hands back there. I'm proud of you. Anybody else? You're saying that to me. Just slip your hand up so I can see. I see your hand in the back there. I see your hand. Anybody else? That's me. I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. This is what I want to do. If you raise your hand today, would you kind? Would you do one thing for me? Would you make your way out of the seats and come forward so we can pray with you? And church, as they make their way forward, if you raise your hand, come on up. We want to pray with you this morning. Church, let's clap for every person that raised their hand today. Stronger than all sin. Yes, hallelujah. Come on, they're still coming forward. Let's clap for these families. Men and women giving their life to Jesus today. We're going to need some 
some more altar workers up here. It's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. A new start. God is good. God is good. We have some altar workers over here, Rob. We have some altar workers right here. They're open. Praise God. I'm going to make a second call. For those that are saying, there's someone I know, as pastor was preaching, as he was talking, I can, I, this a name came up, somebody came up, I know there's someone I need to forgive. It could be your dad, it could be your parents, it could be your ex, it could be, it could be your children, it could be a cousin, a family member, an uncle, someone who's hurt and abused you. Maybe they don't deserve your, their, your forgiveness, but the reality is we did not deserve God's forgiveness, yet he gave it to us today with that same love. God can give you the power to forgive them. If you're saying today, I need to forgive somebody, there's somebody that I need to let go of, I've been holding on to. What I want you to do is make your way out into the aisle. And I want you to come forward today and let today be the day where you finally let it all go. Let it all go today. Give it all to him today. Give it to the Lord today. There's somebody that you need to forgive. Somebody you need to just come clean and say, God, I give it all to you. I give it all to you. Come on, let's get excited for them as they make their way forward right now. This is awesome. This is great. Come on, it's time to be free. It's time to be free. It's time to let it all go. It's time to be free. To the heart of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Altar workers, discipleship group leaders, we need you up here. Thank you so much. If you're a DG leader, a ministry leader, we need you up here. We're gonna, we can really use your help. Thank you so much for responding and taking care of everyone. For everyone that just came up, I have a few more moments. Just look at me for a second. Everybody that just came forward, if you step forward for any reason, I just want you to look at me for a quick second. What we're gonna do, we're gonna walk you through this process. Your next step is to be baptized. And to be baptized, the person in front of you, they're gonna pray with you and they're gonna sign you up for your next step. And when you get baptized, what you're saying is, I'm dying to the old me, going underwater like a grave, and I'm coming up, resurrecting with Christ, a new creation in Jesus. It's a huge day. You'll invite your friends and family, and we'll make it a big day. And then your, your next step also is to join a class called Holy Warriors. What's the name of the class? Holy Warriors, and as you join this class, you're gonna learn how to walk with God. You're gonna learn how to live for Him. You're gonna learn how to read your Bible, how to pray, how to grow, how to fight your fight. We're gonna be right there with you every step of the way, okay? Are we ready to pray, church? Come on, let's give God praise for all these souls right now that are coming to the Lord, being set free. Let's pray. And if right now in your seat you wanna pray, say this prayer with your heart. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, Thank you for loving me enough to give your life and to die for me. I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you resurrected from the dead. And I put my faith in you. Fill me now with your spirit. I make you the Lord of my life. I will never be the same again. And God, I forgive everybody who has hurt me i let it go i give it to you i forgive them for the pain for the hurt that they've caused me i give it all to you god give me the love for them give me fill me with peace so i can love them and bless them thank you god you forgave me so I, I'll forgive everybody. Thank you, Lord. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all say amen and amen. Church, can we give God just one more shout of praise for how good and amazing he is? This is what Sundays are all about. Souls are being saved and lives transformed. Church, we love you. Remember this Wednesday, Pastor Marco is going to continue his abortion 
series. He, uh, he's in the end time series, but he's going to talk about abortion this Wednesday. It's going to be the final segment of our end time series. So if you've missed any of them, you're going to not want to miss this Wednesday. Be here Wednesday night. And remember, ladies, you can sign up for the women's conference. You have until the end of today to join all the raffles and the perks and have a chance to win. Sign up on the app or in the foyer. We love you so much. If you need prayer, come on forward. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you, church. God is for you. No one can come against you.